Okay. Uh, let's talk to Lord Matt Ridley, Conservative peer, British journalist and businessman. Uh, good evening, Lord Ridley. Good evening, Kevin. Nice to speak to you. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, what do you think about this? So there, there's this kind of orthodoxy, isn't there, about climate change that uh, the government in particular, Boris especially, uh, seems to assume that we're all right on side about all of this. Anything you do to help save the planet, yeah, we're, yeah, you can you can rest assured that we'll be backing you all the way. So uh, as Claire Fox pointed out in the Lords, uh, we are not uh, required to approve of these measures. We're, we're required to be educated uh, so that we go along with them. There's something wrong about the approach to climate change policy uh, in terms of the people, in terms of the way the government treats the people. Would you agree? Yes, I would. I'm a loyal supporter of this government, unlike Claire, but I think uh, that the competitive auction of hysterical alarm uh, is getting out of control. Um, because actually what's happened in the last 40 years, and I've been writing about climate change for more than 35 years. I first wrote about it when I was science editor of The Economist in the 1980s. I've grown steadily less alarmed because climate change has happened steadily more slowly than we expect, not faster than we expect. Go back and look at the models in 1990. They were predicting a third of a degree per decade or three degrees in, in a century. Uh, and we haven't seen anything like that. We've seen about half that rate of increase, and we've seen no increase in in uh, uh, droughts, floods or storms, the frequency or the damage, uh, well, the damage they do, yes, but that's because there are more people around building more houses to get damaged. But the death toll is going down all the time. So we've got this strange contradiction between a, a phenomenon that is underperforming and a response that is supposed to get more and more hysterical every time. And if you question this, if you say, look, hang on, I don't think we ought to be rushing into precipitous action that might be very expensive and hurt poor people particularly. Um, uh, you are somehow regarded as, 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 a, as a heretic, as a blasphemer, rather than as a reasonable person. I had an argument in the House of Lords in a committee meeting with uh, somebody, a professor, who said that um, we can't possibly meet the 2050 target because we're not going to be able to get enough energy from non-carbon sources we'd have to start building them now and i said i quite agree and he said therefore we should ban all flying from now on oh. we should declare the airline I industry illegal oh. And I said, well, hang on, that just doesn't seem like it's politically feasible and doesn't seem very fair on people. <laughs> uh, he said, well, don't argue with me about it. You lot voted for it. And I said, no, we didn't. We didn't get a vote on the net zero target in the House of Lords. They did in the Commons, and they all went like sheep through the, through the lobbies in favour of it. But there's a horrible collision coming between the, the, the rhetoric of trying to meet this target of uh, net zero 2020 and the reality of the cost for people on the ground of replacing their, their heating and their cars and not going on holiday ever again and that kind of thing. Now, there always is sometimes a, a, a time and a place for tokenism, you know, making a gesture that sends the right message. Uh, which is, of course, what Britain is doing in terms of climate change. However, we produce uh, less than 2% of the world's pollution. Uh, China, which, by the way, uh, is busy building 185 new fossil fueled power stations uh, to add to its existing 1,082 fossil fuel power stations. Uh, we in this country have three. Uh, so they produce 28% of the world's pollution. So that, in fact, unless we can get countries like China, India, Brazil, these huge polluters to do anything about it, anything that we do in this country, if we all went back to uh, riding horses and carts and living in huts and got rid of electricity and petrol altogether, it would make not a jot of difference to climate change. So uh, I think a, a many people in this country feel why are we being asked to get more and more feudal to save the planet where nothing we will do uh, can make any difference and china and india and the like don't do anything when you when you make that point in parliament the the response comes back uh, that we are leading the world we are setting an example to the world and people puff up their chests with pride at the way we are out in front showing the world what they need to do to follow us 
Now, not only is that highly unrealistic, I don't think in Beijing they sit there thinking, oh, my God, Lord Deben's Climate Change Committee has recommended something. Therefore, <laughs> exactly. those brilliant Brits, we better do what they're doing. Yeah, or, my, or, 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 or sort of, oh, look, have you seen they put cycle lanes in all the towns all around England <laughs> during the lockdown? That, that, right, also, we better get on other, board. It's nonsense, yeah. isn't it? But the other point is it's very patronising. It, 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 it's actually rather colonialist, imperialist. It sort of implies that the, 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 the great unwashed Chinese and Indians are sitting waiting for the latest pronouncement from Britain as to what they should do. I'm sorry, that's not the way the world works. You know, they, 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 we, p- people don't learn lessons from other countries, don't, particularly from, you know, countries that used to rule them. They, they say, uh, no, well, sorry, we're going to make our own decisions about things. Uh, so I, I find it amazingly patronising the way people talk about our policy of setting an example to the world. Um, that's not the way the rest of the world sees it. They think we're just a small country off the north coast of Europe that has that is quite good at doing financial services and a few other industries, uh, um, and they don't care how we get our power or how many, um, uh, how many degrees we turn down our central heating. Uh, and uh, as I say... Th- but still, the people of Britain are subjected to this, these increasingly stringent climate change policies, as you say, uh, somehow or other to show that we're leading the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think people really look into it, but I think it's a disgrace. I mean, the G7 countries recently all signed a treaty saying we are going to no longer fund uh, fossil fueled power stations, coal fueled power stations. Uh, who wasn't involved in that treaty? China, India, Brazil. Uh, uh, they're not doing it. And the reason they don't do it is because if they did start adopting the kind of climate change policies that we adopt, uh, fuel prices in their countries, energy prices, would become too expensive for their poor residents. So we're locked in a cycle of pointlessness here, aren't we, in Britain? Well, I'm afraid we are. We're driving up our energy costs. We're doing futile. We're doing worse than futile policy. We're doing counterproductive policies. I mean, we're burning wood in Drax power station now instead of coal. That produces more carbon dioxide, not less. You know, and and we're saying, oh, well, that's all right because the trees will grow again. Well, they won't grow for, you know, they don't grow overnight. You know, by the time they've grown again, we're into the supposed climate change problems. So that argument makes no sense. We banned uh, incandescent light bulbs and made people adopt uh, uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs. Well, that was a disaster. They were toxic. They didn't work very well. They didn't give good light. Uh, And anyway, LED lights were on the way. We should have just waited till they came along and the market replaced incandescents with LED lights. We forced people back into diesel cars, which was a huge mistake for the point of view of air quality. So uh, a lot of the, you know, the problem is we set out these virtuous ambitions and then a bunch of crony capitalist um, uh, people jump on the bandwagon and exploit whatever it is, uh, the naivety of our politicians and get subsidies for doing things that enrich them and their friends, but uh, cost a lot for ordinary people, particularly here where I live in the north of England, you know, that this stuff doesn't go down well. It is not a, a vote winner. And it's time the, uh, the well, it, it's it's not a vote loser yet because people, because the cost has largely been disguised on electricity bills. But once people start having to fork out 20 grand to replace their gas-fired uh, central heating with a um, uh, uh, ground source heat pump that doesn't work very well in cold weather, uh, then I'm sorry, but the red wall is going to make its views known. Yeah, well, uh, the London wall where I live will also make its views known. This is just not, not good. It's cold down there. <laughs> not, not, it's not nearly as cold down there. You don't know what it's like. <laughs> oh, that's true. Uh, listen, Lord Ridley, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I took, I agree with every word you said. Uh, Lord Matt, Ridley there on uh, the kind of ongoing absurdity of the virtue signalling of these climate change protagonists in government.